We do. Okay, so tonight we're gonna just go over some cases that you absolutely have to know if you're gonna know some cases. There, there are some cases that if, because I get a lot of emails and I've got a lot of, um, I got a lot of backup emails I have to create here that I've got to send out. People have emailed me and asked me for posters and stuff and I haven't been behind my computer much for the past few, for the past few hours I've been behind my computer doing other stuff so I haven't jumped into it yet but I will send off a bunch of free posters tonight after I finish this live broadcast. If you can afford one, pick one up, thanks. I can't get this damn light right because this little room's set up a little bit funny. How you guys doing? How's everybody doing? So we're going to go over cases tonight that you absolutely have to know. That you have to know. There are cases that you, you absolutely have to know. If you, if you don't know these cases, then you don't understand the history of America and the history of the world. And this is a very brief synopsis of the cases that you absolutely have to know. There are cases that you, if you don't know the cases, then you don't understand the United States of America. You follow me? If you don't know these cases, then you don't know what America is about. You don't understand the foundation of America. If you don't understand how the cases formed what our country is today. And so I'm going to go just, I'm going to just skip over each one and give you guys a little bit of it. How's everybody doing? How's, how's everybody doing? 36 people. Philly's in the house. Good to see you, Philly. Stump and nubs. <laughs> Casanova. Tony's here. How you doing, Tony? David. Uh, Manga Gypsy. Zachary Reed. Good to see you. D Sean is there. Cool. What's going on, Rob? Robert, how you doing? Robert, good to see you. So... Now we're gonna start in the beginning. We're gonna go. We're gonna start in the beginning, and we're gonna move. T Roy is here. Good to see you, T Roy. We're gonna start in the beginning of the cases, and we're going to work from the beginning of the inception of our country. We we could even go back. No, let's not go back to the Magna Carta. Let's just go to the very beginning of the inception of natural law. So that's what we'll start with. We'll start with the inception of natural law, and then we'll do social contract over the top of natural law. And then we're gonna go over each case that is just absolutely imperative that you understand the case. <laughs> is that so hard to understand? Where is everybody from? Can you guys type in right down there where everybody's watching from so I know where everybody's from because there's specific states that created certain nuance in our country. I guess it's the best way to say it, certain nuance. So let me know where you guys are from. Uh, New Mexico, natural law, Southern Oregon, Colorado. Good to see you, Colorado. Uh, or or uh, South Dakota's in the house. Egan, Minnesota. I'm gonna be heading to Minnesota pretty soon. New Mexico pretty soon. Texas, I've got some traveling to do here over the next little while. I'm just getting a couple things in order. This shirt just came out of the dryer. It's time for new shirts coming this week. I cannot wait. My God, I need a new shirt. I've had the same shirt for months. <laughs> Los Angeles, Yorkers, Massachusetts. Okay. So, so that the people who are watching this on YouTube aren't too horrifically bored, um, let's jump right into cases that you absolutely, that's obviously a fire truck, I can't control that. So let's jump right into cases that you absolutely have to know, things you have to understand about our country. So I'll do a very, very quick civics lesson so you can understand the basis of America, just the very base, so you understand what the hell this country is founded upon, okay? So... So now in the beginning, you're going to have a guy named John Locke. He's going to be born in 1632. You've heard of the term, all men are created equal. Well, you can give that credit to John Locke, the founder of natural law, or it's called Lockean theory, L-O-C-K-E-A-N, Lockean theory. And what John Locke is going to do is give the basic principles of life, liberty, property. You have the right to, to have liberty. You have the right to have a life and you have a right to own private property. You have that right. So he's going to come up with that, and that's going to be the basis of our entire Constitution, our entire Bill of Rights, is based on John Locke's philosophy of natural law. Your life is as important as my life, and just in case you didn't know, back in 1652, 1653, that idea wasn't very popular with kings and royalty who, who, who didn't want um, to, for your life or your brother's life to be worth as much as the royalty's life. So he wasn't a necessarily popular figure for that 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 regard that your life was as much as worth as royalties 
It doesn't matter how famous or royal the person is, your lives are equally valuable. You have as much to write to life as that person over there does. And that's why a lot of Lachian theory and Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it's always like, you know, if you don't do this, then to the death, right? Really, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. You know, and then we're going to get into the next part of, of, so natural law is going to state that you have a right to life, liberty, and property, and that you're born free. Well, then Thomas Hobbes, who's around the same time as John Locke, comes up with this idea that says, well, if we're all free, then what will happen is uh, I'll end up, you know, killing you and taking what you have because I coveted those things. Thou shalt not covet, right? That, the reason why that's a commandment in the Bible is because when you covet what someone else has, you can kill that person and take it because you're free and your life is your own. You don't have to live under anybody else's rule of law. You are free. That's what natural law is a dirty, gritty thing. It's not natural law isn't, isn't uh, some um, shining diamond of purality that you put up on the windowsill for the sunlight to gaze through. <laughs> that is not natural law. It's a very rough and tumble idea of the building blocks of a society. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is going to come in 1712, is going to die in 1778, something like that. Uh, always check my years because I have dyslexia and sometimes I mess up silly years. Really, I've made some silly mistakes. So anyway, but the point is, is I'm pretty sure he's 1712 and he's going to work on top of Thomas Hobbes' social contract to smooth out the rough edges of what natural law is. You can do anything you want if I'm free. I'll just take that house of yours because me and my sons are stronger than your sons and we'll just take that. That's what we'll just do. We're free to do it. What John, what Thomas Hobbes comes up with is bellium omnius contras omna. That's, that's a Thomas Hobbes' famous saying of a war of all against all. And so then John Jacques Rousseau is going to come in and say, hey, Hobbes, you got some good ideas here, but we don't want to be led by a monarchy. We want small little democracies, small little democracies that are homogeneous, that are all the same kind of, of, of people together. And so he's going to have the idea of a democracy based on the rule of law that we all agree to live under a certain amount of rules of laws. And that way we won't have bellium omnius contra omna, which is Thomas Hobbes saying of a war of all against all. You don't want to live like that. That's why I said if there's a revolutionary war here, I'm leaving. If there's a, if there's a, if there's a civil war here, I'm leaving. I'll come back when it's over to reestablish the basic philosophy of natural law and the social contract. I'll be back to reinstitute the Constitution. <laughs> I'm not going to die because you're a moron and think shooting people is a good idea in a revolution. I'm out. Even though Thomas Hobbes endorses the idea of a revolution once the revolution has begun. Thomas Hobbes says that if there is a revolution, then you should not join it. You should not start a revolution. But if a revolution has begun, then Thomas Hobbes says you're not in, in sin if you join the revolution. They're all biblical. It's all anyway. So, so there's the basic foundation. And then the, the third philosopher who's going to come in is Montesquieu. And Montesquieu is going to write a book called Spirit of Laws. And that book is going to be published in 1750. And this is the book that Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison are going to pretty much try to copy as much as they can from it to create... Uh, the, the checks and balances system of our government, okay? And the checks and balances system of the spirit of laws of Montesquieu. So you got Locke, you got Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Montesquieu, and the checks and balances system is the idea that we have three separate branches that check and balance on each other. That's the basic idea. It, it doesn't, doesn't work out. So, so now then you say, okay, well, so there's the basic f structure. So when you hear Article 1, Section 2, that's just talking about the congressional branch of government, the second article, right? Article one, I mean, section two. So article one, article two is the executive, article three is the judiciary or the federal branch, the, the, the Supreme Court. So now the cases that you have to know that work for this system, for this legal system to work, the system is called, it's a jurisprudence system. It's a jurisprudence system. That's the theory of law that we live on is jurisprudence. If you, that's a big word. You, you know, someone should drop that down in the comment. That's a big word, the, the jurisprudence. That's the theory of the law. And you get into all kinds of stuff from there. But the cases that you absolutely have to know, you have to understand the foundation of America. 
First and foremost, you have to understand that we, we got the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in 1776. It's going to be ratified in 1791. You have to know that. You have to know that little tidbit of information right there. And then you have to know what Marbury versus Madison is and what it did. Marbury versus Madison is, I think I have, this is Marbury here. This is Marbury. And there's James Madison there, right here. So this is where Marbury sues Madison after John Adams is president. And what happens at the, ultimately what happens is we get, we, we get a Supreme Court that is, is, can have judicial review over any cases. That, that's the ultimate result of Marbury versus Madison. You have to understand Marbury versus Madison is a gigantic grab for Federalist power. You have to understand that. And, and now that I'm giving you the precursor of where to look, you have to begin research and you have to educate yourself. You know, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Let me just stay on the, let me just stay on the cases. So you have to know that Marbury versus Madison is the reason why our judiciary has so much power over us. Why the legislators, Article 1 of the government, Article 1 is the congressional branch of government, the people that we elect. The power of the people is supposed to be through the congressional branch of government. Makes a lot of sense because these guys write laws and then the president signs the laws into effect. So the people that we vote in, those people should have the power. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court can veto what those people say. You, you see, the Supreme Court can, can override what these people say, and the Supreme Court says, and here's and the Supreme Court says that they are acting in the name of our rights. But yet the Supreme Court can veto what Congress legislates. Nine unelected people that have absolutely nothing in common with you and me who say they're working for our rights and have done nothing since the beginning of the court except for to try to diminish our rights, starting with Marbury versus Madison. You have to know that. You absolutely have to know that case. So now, uh, you know, also there's, I, I, I talk about Jeffrey Kaplan all the time, but watch Jeffrey Kaplan's Marbury versus Madison video. He does a 45 minute video on it. It's really good. So now right here, as you move forward, you have to know uh, Martin versus Hunter's Lisi. You, you have to know this case. You have to know what happens here. What happens here is the Supreme Court takes the right over any cases that have to do with your civil liberties. So this is about property being taken from a British soldier. The, the fundamentals of the, the story of the case isn't as important as you understanding that in Martin versus Hunter's Lisi, they said that we are the arbitrators of your civil rights. We are the only people who can do cases about civil rights. We can have federal courts too, but we are the ultimate deciders, the, the nine unelected personnel. We are the ultimate deciders of all cases that have to do, and this is about to do with property. And remember what I said, everything is based on John Locke's theory of life, liberty, or property. You see, so now it's starting to, now do you see how it starts to come together for you? So the Supreme Court says that John Locke's theory of natural law, that everybody has a right to life, liberty, and property, if it's a case about private property, if it's a case about private property that you have here, your freedom standards, right to have your home, then if there's gonna be a case about property, we are the only people who can hear that case. Do you follow? So, so it, 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 all, it all starts to come together for you so quickly. It all starts to come together for you so quickly. And so, you know, one of the most important things you have to remember about John Locke, and you can put this into your, into your search engine, whichever one you use, John Locke's theory was that, that liberty is far reaching, that liberty, your freedom, goes miles before it's taken. He is not about you going to a dungeon, and that's the, the true founder of the philosophy of America is John Locke's theory of natural law. So then you have to go into Johnson versus Macintosh here. So in Johnson versus Macintosh, this is a really, really wacky case. And this is the case where this goes back to the 1453 palpable. What's, let, me, let me say it properly. Let me say, oh, shoot. I actually just wrote it right here. Yeah, I'm saying it right. Palpable, palpable, palpable. It, th this, this case here, Johnson versus McIntosh, this goes back to the 1455 palpable. And, and this is where it's going to truly create the idea from Pope Nicholas that the Portugal and, and Spanish slave trade is perfectly viable. And so then in the, in, in the palpable of 1493, I believe, 1493 is where we start to talk about, it, in, in the palpable of 1493 with Pope, Pope, Pope Nicholas, 
I believe it's Pope Nicholas. I'm pretty sure the 14, 1493 palpable. And what that's going to say. And so the most disgusting thing you'll ever read is John Marshall's opinion in Macintosh versus Johnson from 1823. It's one of the most disgusting things you'll ever read. It's, it's, it's what it does is it legitimizes popes and monarchs who, who gave permission to European settlers to colonize any Spanish land. And this starts in 1455 with the palpable. It's Pope Alexander. No, it's, it's, it's Pope Nicholas. And, and then his son who uses a, uh, his middle name instead of using his dad's name. I'm pretty sure if I, if I remember quite correctly, but I don't want to start looking stuff up when I'm on here. So it, uh, feel free to fact check anything I'm saying. Everything I'm saying is pretty, pretty, pretty damn close to exactly accurate. I, I could be off a little bit, but it's pretty close there. So <laughs> is it Pope Nicholas? It's going to bug the hell out of me. Anyway, so the point is, though, is then John Marshall writes the opinion in Johnson v. McIntosh. And what the opinion says in Johnson v. McIntosh is that that because of the 1455, 1493 palpable by Pope Nicholas the fifth, I believe, he, they say that you can take the Native Americans' land and it's yours. It's your land because you conquered this land and all of its inhabitants. All of the inhabitants of this land belong to you. They are your servants. They are in servitude. They are your slave forever. And he quotes it. John Marshall quotes it in the 1823 holding of Johnson v. McIntosh. You absolutely have to know it. If you're an American, you have to know it. Johnson versus McIntosh. You have to know that case. So that when Native American people say something to you, you know exactly what happened. It was Johnson versus McIntosh where the Supreme Court, remember, John, Mar uh, John Marshall, head of the Supreme Court, was previously the Secretary of State for John Adams, the, the second president. And when John Marshall and uh, when John Adams was leaving the presidency, he appointed John Marshall to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. <laughs> Do you understand how dirty it is? Do you understand how absolutely filthy the beginning is? The, the beginning is a, is a filthy mix of... of, of and I don't want to get on my judgments. I just want to stay on facts with you guys so you know the most important cases. And so let's just keep going down the line. So, if, okay, now, if you don't know the Dred Scott case, I think everybody here knows the Dred Scott case. If you don't know Dred Scott, a very light overview of it is Dred Scott was a slave to, uh, I believe the, the last name was Sanford. Yeah, the last name was Sanford. And his master died. And so then when the when his master died, they went north of the of the border. And back then there was a 50-50 line. If you were south of the, the border, you were a slave. North, you were you were free. And so then he went above to, to Chicago to Illinois to bury his master. And when he got there, he announced to the master's widow that he was free. I'm a free man. And so then the widow's brother, Sanford, sued Dred Scott and it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that Dred Scott was um, property. He was not a man. And I don't know what you're doing testifying here in court, but you shouldn't be here because you're a piece of property. Property shouldn't be talking. So that's pretty much the truth. That's, 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 I mean, of course, that's a, um, um, yeah, that's it. No, that's, that's, that's it. They say he's property. So that, that 1455, that 1875 holding of Dred Scott, that's going to kick off the Civil War. That, well, it's not going to quite begin the Civil War. The Civil War is going to begin when John Brown in 1859 is going to ask his, uh, his best friend, <clears throat> uh, Douglas, if he wants to go with him to go and raid Hopper's Ferry. <laughs> and, and Frederick Douglas says, no, I'm not going to go with you, bro. I'm not going to go with you. You're crazy. Because uh, John Brown is so pissed off about the Dred Scott holding that he then goes and attacks uh, Harper's Ferry in 1859. He sits in the jail for a month and he writes this big long thing and then he um, gets hung. And so then that is the spark for the Civil War, just so you guys know. How's everybody doing? How is everybody doing? Good to see everybody. So then as we keep going down the, the, the line, you, you have to know Cruikshank. You have to know the Cruikshank case. You, you, you absolutely have to know this case. You have to know it. You have to know it inside now. And this case is going to be, 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 be based off the 1871. So then this is where it comes full circle. The Cruikshank case is going to be based off the 1871 Enforcement Act is where you're going to get uh, U.S. Section uh, U.S. Section 18, Section 242, which is deprivation of rights under the color of law. That's where that's going to come from. Your deprivation of rights under the color of law is going to come directly from the Enforcement Act of 1871, first published in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. So when that Enforcement Act comes out with U.S. Code 18, Section 242, that is deprivation 
of rights under the color of law, and that comes directly, uh, and they're, they're charged with, with deprivation of rights under the, with, with violating the Enforcement Act in 1876, and this is based on the Colfax Massacre, but then this case right here is where the Supreme Court says, where the Supreme Court says, you know, that's all of our favorite sayings, the Supreme Court says that we cannot enforce your Bill of Rights. These guys up here, they say, we're really sorry, Americans, we cannot, the government cannot instill your rights, we can't do it. And that's all going to be based off the Cruikshank case. You absolutely have to know it. This is just a light gloss over as to what it is. You have to go and read it. You have to go and read this case. You have to look this up and show the children so history doesn't repeat itself. This is why I'm showing this to you. So that the, you show this to a 10-year-old, 12-year-old kid, and the kid will learn this case and say, this can never happen again. Or it'll happen again. Or it'll happen again. Or it'll happen again. You have to teach a kid about Cruikshank. You have to teach him. And so, you know, we can easily go into the Reese case, which is about voting. You have to know this case, you, United States versus Reese of, of 1870. This is going to allow states to create barriers for voting. And so you have to know this case. This is a big case in the history of time because this isn't going to be undone until the 1965 Civil, voting right, Civil Rights Act on voting. It's not going to be fixed until 1965. This case of Reese, meaning that the 1876 holding is going to last 100 years, 90, 89 years. You're going to have 89 years of voting fraud, of, 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 of tinkering with voting because the Supreme Court said, the Supreme Court said, do you see? You have to know this case. Your children have to know this case. You know, and then you have to know the slaughterhouse cases of 1873. The reason why it's called the slaughterhouse cases is because in Louisiana, what they did is they, they gave the rights to... One slaughterhouse company it was called the, the 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 Louisiana Slaughterhouse Company, and then the the Louisiana Slaughterhouses Association, the entire association of other people who slaughter pigs, sued them and went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, "No, no, it's fine. We can give monopolies to anybody we want." And it reinst it went against your Fourteenth Amendment and your Thirteenth Amendment. But you have to know the slaughterhouse cases. Your children should know the slaughterhouse cases. Okay. So then, as we continue down the line, uh, you have to know the nineteen hundred case of Bad Elk. Uh, lone Wolf, uh, right here, uh, uh, Van Elk versus the United States. You have to know this case. And this is where uh, Rufus Peckham is going to write the opinion that you are absolutely not allowed to resist the police. You have to know this case. Uh, this is where uh, a police officer named John Bad Elk, who was a Native American, uh, he shot another uh, officer named John Killsback. That's the names. And then John Bad Elk, they went to the hospital, they went to the Supreme Court, and they held that it's not murder if the cop doesn't have a warrant. If the cop, if there was no warrant for his arrest, no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, because John Bad Elk was correct, then John Bad Elk was not charged with murder. He was charged with a civil rights violation, a, a, a manslaughter. And so then Rufus Peckham, though, his famous words are, you're not allowed to resist police. This is where the charge of resisting police comes from today. This is still on the books today. This is still valid case law today. You can't resist police today because of the 1900 holding of Bad Elk versus the United States. John Bad Elk, who was a Native American, being put through assimilation. If you don't know what assimilation is, if you don't know what assimilation is, you absolutely, I'm not going to go into it here, but assimilation is a lot of things that were done to Native American people. If you don't know the term assimilation, if someone wants to pop it up there, you're welcome to do so. Assimilation. What does assimilation mean to the Native American people in America? It means destroying your race and killing your race off. That's what assimilation means. That's why you have two Native American cops who shot each other and John Badoff dies in jail. And then... I can't, I, I can't, let me stay on the cases. I have really bad OCD and, and ADHD and I didn't take any ADHD medication today. So I'm just trying to stay focused and just get this right to you guys the best I possibly can. So, so now you're going to have two different cases here and both of these cases, Giles versus Teasley and Giles versus Giles, Giles versus Harris, Giles versus Teasley. These two cases right here are both going to hinge. Both of these cases are going to hinge off the Reese case. The, the, the starry decisis, the jurisprudence. So the, juris, the jurisprudence is the, the entire theory of the law, but the starry decisis, the case precedence, is going to be based on United States versus Reese, which we talked about, which the Supreme Court allowed the states to create barriers to voting. Literacy tests, poll taxes, all these things that you've heard about in the past. Well, now this is an actual application of them because then in Giles versus Harris and Giles versus Teasley, this is where the Alabama state registrar, the, the actual 
like the just like in any state today, there's an Arizona Board of Registers, and this is the same thing. So Giles is a guy who's who has uh, voted in Alabama every year since, of course, 1870, since the 15th Amendment made it legal for black men over the age of 21 to vote. So that's how the 15th Amendment gets bastardized in 1870. Black men over the age of 21 can vote, but then in Reese versus United States, the, the states can create barriers to voting just six years later, six years after the 15th Amendment has passed. And so then what happens just 30 years later in Giles versus Harris and Giles, so he sues Harris, who's a member of the board of the uh, Alabama State Registers, and he loses. He's backed by Booker T. Washington. He's the guy that pays for the lawsuit. Even though he's known as an Uncle Tom, remember, he gave his speech, the Atlantic Compromise, in 1875. After 1876, after before Cruikshank, before the Cruikshank holding. So now as you continue forward here, he's then going to back him here. And these are voting rights cases. You have to know them both that Jackson Giles was a black man who sued for a civil right to vote in 1903 and 1904. He lost in both years of the Supreme Court. Are you shocked? I'm not shocked one single bit. These are Supreme Court cases you absolutely have to know. You have to know these cases. So then we're going to continue on. So... So the whole thing with our government, and this is what you've seen time and time again, is when you make a deal with the government, the idea is once we sign a contract, the 14th Amendment, the right to contract, you and I have locked in that contract, and that is our civil right to do so. You want to make a deal with me, and you say, hey, Chili, you know, I'll hire you to do this, and I sign the contract, and you say yes, and then we, there we go. We have a right to contract from the 14th Amendment, 1868, equal protection under the law. How's that? What's going to happen next? We've made treaties with the Native American people because as we started to kill off those people and we did it through through horses, but that's another story. Then right here in Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, this is Chief Lone Wolf who's going to, they're going to, he's going to sue the United States government because uh, uh, Ch uh, Chief Lone Wolf is going to sue Hitchcock who's in the government. And the reason why he's going to sue him and because they're violating the treaty that gives the Indians, the Native Americans, their sovereign land. You have to know this case. This is the case that truly decimated the, the Native American culture in America because it took away their land. They then were issued a certain allotment of acres of land, and then anything outside of that fenced-in area was then called surplus, and the United States government gave it away or sold it to new uh, European settlers coming to the United States in 1903. I mean, we're still a very young country. We saw people settling in 1900s. You have to know the case of Lone Wolf. Hendrick versus Maryland. You have to know this case. This is what allows your state to create traffic laws that allows you. That's why there's a California DMV. That's why there's a New York DMV because of Hendrick versus Maryland. This is what allows the, the, the state that you live in to create the Arkansas D D Department of Motorized Vehicle. Very important. It's a, it's a historic case that very few people take the time to research and read and learn. Your children have to know the case. The case eventually, I don't know. I don't want to get lost on solutions here. The 1919 case of Cynic versus United States. You see the funny spelling of the name Cynic? Because uh, uh, I believe it was Charles Cynic and Elizabeth Bayer. Cynic is S-C-H-E-N-C-K. Very uh, A foreign spelling. Uh, I don't know how to... I, uh, anyway, the point is, is Charles Cynic suit... It, it goes to the Supreme Court for handing out pamphlets that say, assert your rights. And Oliver Wendell Holmes is going to write the famous saying, you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater. When the, the pamphlets that Cynic is passing around say, assert your rights, do not go to war. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. Do not go to war. Assert your rights. Okay? And so Charles Sinek, the, the Supreme Court in 1919 is going to be the white court, and the white court's going to uphold his conviction and put him in prison for handing out pamphlets to say, you're, you're not a slave. Don't go to war. And so then... Oliver Wendell Holmes is going to write the opinion, don't scream fire in a busy movie theater, your First Amendment right is limited, and now people in 2021 are going to walk around saying that stupid, stupid saying, you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater, your First Amendment right to free speech is limited. If you ever hear someone say that, correct them. There is no limit to free speech. We can say whatever the hell we want. This guy is burning in a pit of fire now. <laughs> <laughs> And as you guys know uh, from my Catholic upbringing, I can get biblical on their ass when it comes to uh, the insults of where I think that they are down in the 6600th layer of Hades burning with their bones turned to dust before Satan. And may hell have the fury of a thousand women scorned. <laughs>
I swear I could be a televangelical preacher. So now, as we continue down the line, you have to know the 1919 case of Cynic. You have to know it. You have to understand it. You have to understand that your First Amendment right, the idea that your rights are limited, was a fabrication of this government colluding, the branches of government colluding. The, the president wanted this to go down. The president wanted your First Amendment right to say, don't go to war. The president wanted that to be changed. He colluded with the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the opinion of Oliver Wendell Holmes had already been written in a previous case and the Supreme Court Justice at the time, I believe it was Byron White, I think, uh, uh, no, it was uh, Melvin Fuller. It was Melvin Fuller, the Fuller Court. Melvin Fuller, am I correct on this? No, I'm incorrect. It was, Byron, it was the White Court. And White was the Supreme Court Justice on a previous case. And he told Oliver Wendell Holmes, man, that line of you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater, that is such a good line, dude. Let's save that opinion for something important, for a bigger case. Did you know that? Did you know that? The famous line of this piece of uh, tyrant uh, garbage here, he, he wrote the famous line, you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater, and he had already written it for a previous case, and the Supreme Court Justice White came to him. White looked just like him, same big handlebar. Listen, all of the homes fought in the Civil War. This guy was a total beast. You have no idea. You have no idea. He, he, he was a beast. He killed a lot of people. He was a murderer. He killed tons of people. He fought in the Civil War with Lincoln. I'm not kidding. He killed a lot of people. This, I mean, uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the Civil War from 1861 to 18 to 1865, he was 18 years old. He fought in the Civil War, killed lots of people. Ended up uh, becoming very powerful and getting on the Supreme Court. And then he, uh, uh, almost every single case, almost every single Supreme Court holding that he ever wrote for every single case, this piece of. Sh of, of garbage was on, has been reversed, has been reversed. Total piece of garbage, you have no idea. Just so you guys know, in the Ivy League schools, in Harvard, in Yale, in Princeton, because I, I audit all their classes, so you put a, a lecture out, I'll listen to it, right? They all revere Oliver Wendell Holmes. They, uh, they all show some great deference to this man, Oliver Wendell Holmes. He's a great savior. Just so you know, just so you know, he was an abolitionist and at the same time a white supremacist. I'm not kidding. Look up his Harvard speech or you get the term Rough Riders. That comes from the Harvard speech from Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1893 or something. It doesn't matter. But you can find the speech that he gave. So now as we continue down the line here, um, uh, you guys, uh, you want to get a copy of my poster, get it on DeleteLaws.com. Go get a copy of my poster on DeleteLawsWithAZ.com. If you guys can please pick up a copy of my digital poster or the hard copy poster, I do appreciate your support. This is this is, this is how I make a living, this poster right here, to be honest. So so that's, that's, that's how we got to just keep moving them. So now let's continue. Oh, you have to know Corrigan versus Buckley. And then we're going to get into the really nasty raw dog cases of of Terry and, and how bad Terry has just destroyed and decimated and ruined a free America because of Terry. It's coming. It's coming. So now you have to know the 1926 case of Corrigan versus Buckley. Your children have to know this case. You have to teach this to your children. This is where they allowed racial restrictive covenants for you not to be able to sell your home to a person of color. And so you say to yourself, man, you know, this couldn't be repeated now because it's race. We wouldn't allow Corrigan versus Buckley to, uh, to, 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 uh, to happen today. Oh, we wouldn't? We wouldn't? What about if you didn't take the global medication? What if you're not allowed to sell your home to a person who doesn't have the global medication in their system? That's Corrigan versus Buckley repeated. You didn't take the global medication? You can't buy a house in this neighborhood. Corrigan versus Buckley, 1926. What year is this? 2022. That's 96 years. What do we know about history? It's cyclical. History always repeats. We know that. I can show you time and time again where it repeats. Corrigan versus Buckley is on the verge of repeating right now because if you don't take a global medication, well, you can't ride on this bus. You can't go to this restaurant. What are we going back to? Plessy versus Ferguson. I'm so sorry. I, I skipped right over Plessy versus Ferguson. We have to we have to cover Plessy. I was going I was just going so fast. I like I said I make mistakes. I'm not I'm not perfect. So Corrigan versus Buckley makes sure you can't sell your house to a black person. But the 1896 holding of Plessy versus Ferguson is the starry decisis. This is the this is the case precedent. This is the case precedent for Corrigan versus Buckley, where the Supreme Court's going to say racially we hold up the idea you can't buy a house 
if you have this color skin. It, it's illegal to buy a house if you have this color of skin. And that's the jury, jury the, the, the starry decisis is gonna be Plessy versus Ferguson. It's gonna be Plessy versus Ferguson right there. Okay, so then as we continue down the line, I'm, I'm gonna keep going right here, I'm gonna keep going. So now uh, I, wanna, I wanna hit cases that are just groundbreaking. And so I wanna make sure that we go, oh, oh, you know what? I would be remiss if we didn't do Buck versus Buck versus Bell. We have to do Buck versus Bell. So you guys, you know how everybody celebrates Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg? This one over here. Everybody celebrates Ruthie. Ruthie Poo. Ruthie was so great. She wasn't. She was terrible. But so then the 1927 case of Buck versus Bell is where they involuntarily sterilize. Um, uh, is it is it Bell? I believe her name is Bell. And they, they, they involuntarily sterilize you. And this was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's big thing was involuntary sterilization. She's never going to get it passed. Buck versus Bell remains on the books today. You can be involuntarily sterilized by your local state prison. Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that? That's Buck versus Bell right there. So then this is 1920. But then the 1925 case of Carroll versus United States. We have gone over Carroll versus United States on this channel, I would say, you know, 20 times. Because Carol's what's going to create the exigent, exigent circumstances clause, exigent circumstances, and exigent circumstances are going to mean that um, that the police can go around your bill of rights if they say there's going to be a loss of life if they're in hot pursuit. The police say that they're going to seize evidence off of you, seize evidence off of you, and that's Carol versus the United States, which is going to create the automobile exclusionary rule. The automobile exclusionary rule is is what's going to is 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 going to make it so that the cops can go around your rights because your car can drive away. Because your car can drive away, then they can go around your rights. Because alcohol is poison. Because and I've gone over this a hundred times. Because J. Edgar Hoover is poisoning the bottles of alcohol when he takes the head of the FBI in 1924. And then Carroll versus United States 1925 is going to be based on alcohol being poison because J. Edgar Hoover has poisoned the alcohol bottles with his G-men because they can't get a handle on it. And so then they create the automobile exclusionary rule where the FBI can just stop your car and search it without a warrant, violating your Fourth Amendment right to your basic standard of to be free in your person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. You see how all those work together? They all work together. So now after the 1925 case of Carroll versus the United States, everything's gonna go straight downhill from there. It's gonna go purely downhill because now all of these cases here, all these cases here, uh, United States versus Miller, 1939. Okay, so, so, you know, look, if there's a constitutional scholar out there who, who wants to start a conversation about United States versus Miller, that's a conversation worth having because that's going to uphold the 1934 National Firearms Act. But in United States versus Miller, the appellee, the, app the appellate uh, person, the guy being charged, Miller, Jack Miller, he didn't have a lawyer. There was no argument done from the defense on Miller's behalf. The government pushed through a mandate that they only had one side of the story in United States versus Miller, which is the very beginning of creating legislated gun control that the unelected Supreme Court. So let me just give you guys a synopsis of the United States versus Miller so you understand. Just so you understand what happened and why United States versus Miller has to become a conversation within the Second Amendment community. Because we didn't get representation at the Supreme Court level. So Jack Miller robs a bunch of banks and then they, they catch him with a sawed-off shotgun, and then the debate becomes about whether a sawed-off shotgun is part of the Second Amendment's well-regulated militia. But then on the day of court in United States versus Miller, the lawyer doesn't show up because he hasn't been paid. So this Miller has no lawyer in court at the Supreme Court, and the only side presented is the government side, which upholds the 1934 National Firearms Act. You have to understand United States versus Miller. I'm giving you little breadcrumbs here, giving you a map to look at. You have to look at, if you're a crazy gun nut and you don't know how United States versus Miller was created, you, my friend, are doing America a disservice because you have the passion and the fire to change it. But you don't know the case. You have to look up United States versus Miller. You have to go online, watch videos, watch movies. You have to learn everything you absolutely can learn about United States versus Miller. Our gun rights were snatched away without any representation by the people. Only the government lawyers gave a presentation to a unanimous eight to zero Supreme Court that our guns should be regulated. What does thou shalt not be infringed have to do with regulation? Those are two completely different things. So 
then as you continue, you have to know Cora Matsu versus United States. You have to know this case. I mean, I'm, 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 pick, I'm, I'm just grabbing some cases here because each one has valid merit. So United States versus Cora Matsu, this is where Cora Matsu sued the United States after FDR locked him up in a concentration camp. He built concentration camps in America and locked up 100,000 Japanese people. In 1942, he did that to Cora Matsu. Cora Matsu sued, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, no, it was not racist at all. It was not based on violating your constitutional rights based on the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law, regardless of the color of your skin. And so then FDR is found, they say, they say no, because he's appointed seven of the nine Supreme Court justices. Okay, seven of the nine Supreme Court justices he appointed. <laughs> so then you have to know Brown versus Board of Education that desegregates America. It is not done because he's a great humanitarian. It is done because he, he knows he can't control the millions of black community members there are. And so he desegregates to try to assimilate black people like we did the Native Americans and read about assimilation is what he did. And then we have, after that, we have Terry versus Ohio, which is going to put officer safety over all of your rights, over all of your rights. So it's just, how many years is it? You got Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And then 1954 to 1963 is not even nine years before cops can run up and grab you, before cops can run up and grab you. Just nine years between Terry versus Ohio and Brown versus Board of Education. The laws didn't change where cops could run up and grab you before 1954. But then after 1954, it just takes just nine years. And so what are, the, what, are the, what are the precedents of history? You got the 15th Amendment's going to pass in 1870 to give, give black men over the age of 21 the right to vote. In 1876, the government's going to say, we can't enforce all your rights. Sorry, just took six years. Just took six years for this to go here. If you want to take the, the, the 14th Amendment and go to the slaughterhouse cases, 1868 were the slaughterhouse cases. 1873 was, was the slaughterhouse. So 1868 the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. 1873, the slaughterhouse cases make it so that it's, it's completely overturned. You don't have equal protection anymore. So how many years is that? 1868, five years. So up here, when we go to Terry versus Ohio, we're looking at nine years between Brown versus, Brown versus Board of Education and Terry versus Ohio. History always repeats itself. You're always seeing a cyclical pattern. It's taken a little more time with the modern era, and now it's going to go even slower because now we have the power because we have the people assembling together and uniting. So we have to. So now, how long did it take for Brown versus Board of Education to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson? Plessy versus Ferguson is 1896. Brown versus Board of Education is 1954. Right? That's that's 58 years. 50, 58 years between those two. Now, between Terry versus Ohio in 2022, we're at 54 years. So Terry versus Ohio to today is 54 years. We're on the cusp of change. We are on the cusp of changing this, right? Because you know, as Pace versus Alabama is going to create legal racial segregation with relationships. You can't, have, you can't be with a person of color as your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's Pace versus Alabama. So that's 1883. Loving versus Virginia, 1867. Loving versus Virginia in 1867 is going to overrule Pace versus Alabama of 1883. How long is that? How long is that? 67, 77, 87. That's 90 years almost, 90 years, right? So that's how long it takes to overdo bad Supreme Court holdings, bad Supreme Court holdings. And that's how long it takes. It takes lifetimes. So we're on the cusp of overturning Terry. We have to push harder. So then what Terry does is changes everything. So most of the laws have been created, as you've seen, that are really based on a lot of race and stuff, and it's pretty disgusting. But then the, you have the, the, the mandate law of 1925 Carroll, which creates exigent circumstances, and that case is going to make it so that the cops can go around your rights if the circumstances are dangerous. You hear what I just said? The cops can go around your rights in Carroll versus United States if it's dangerous, if there's going to be a loss of life. If someone's going to die, well, then your rights don't matter. But if your rights don't matter, then more people are going to die. But if it's dangerous from Carroll versus United States, so then in 1968 in Terry versus Ohio, the, office, the, the, the Supreme Court... Uh, Really, the Supreme Court personnel, they're the ones who create the idea that officer safety was the paramount issue in Terry versus Ohio, and that simply wasn't true. But you have to know this case. You have to know what it did. 
It strips away your Fourth Amendment right to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects. And the, and the starry decisis of Terry then goes so that if officer safety is more important, well, then in the 1977 case of Pennsylvania versus Mims, you have to get out of the car in the name of officer safety. And that extends into Pennsylvania versus Mims. And then Pennsylvania, and then here it goes South Dakota versus Opperman, where they can search your car, inventory it, they say. We don't want anything in there to hurt anybody. We need to inventory your car. Make sure everything is safe for you. And then as you continue forward, pretty soon a confidential informant, because reasonable suspicion takes the place of probable cause supported by oath through affirmation, then you get Illinois versus Gates, where the, if the cops get any information about you, they can investigate it because they're reasonably suspicious from Terry versus Ohio. And then from Terry versus Ohio, you're going to get the, uh, where, where, I'm sorry, sorry, where is Wren? Where is Wren? Wren versus United States right here. That's going to say the cops can pull you over on a pretextual stop. They just decide your car looks suspicious and pull you over. They're suspicious of your car. That's an extension of Terry versus Ohio. Michigan State Police is going to allow them, like, allow them to create DUI checkpoints. The cops can run out there and take a look at your car and say, I'm su suspicious that someone on the road is drunk driving. Somebody here is drunk driving. And so they say, yeah, Terry versus Ohio says we can be suspicious. And then we can try to try to prevent the crime because there are three statutes of Terry. Number one, if you committed a crime. Number two, if you've just committed a crime. Number three, if the cops believe you're about to commit a crime. This creates precog, like in that movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise. And so now they can just pre-predict that maybe someone here is drunk driving. Maybe someone here is drunk driving. They got you. They're pulling over a DUI checkpoint. But then don't you run away because if you do, the 1985 holding of Tennessee versus Garner says they can shoot you in the back if they believe officer safety is on the line. So if you get pulled over in a DUI checkpoint and then you run away from that DUI checkpoint, they can shoot you in the back of the head. If you go home and you're in your house, Wilson versus Arkansas is going to say they can kick down your door and kill you in your house if they believe it's for officer safety. Officer safety takes the place of every single right you were listed in the Bill of Rights is replaced by officer safety. You don't have a right to liberty. You don't have a right to self-protection. You don't have a right to be free in your person, houses, papers, and effects. You don't have a right to keep your mouth shut. You don't have a right to face the accuser. The cop is the accuser of you. You don't have a right to a trial of $25. They killed George Floyd for 20 bucks. Like the guy or not, he had a $20 bill that was fake. They killed him when it doesn't even go past the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution of the United States that is written in 1776. And they killed him over a $20 bill. You don't have the right to not face cruel and cruel punishment because they didn't mean to kill George. They just stuck their knees on his neck for nine minutes. That's all. That's all. That's all it was. No big deal. That's all. Okay. Okay. I'm not done. We're just getting warmed up because... You can never, ever forget, never, don't ever forget Florida versus Harris 2013 because this one is where they take it so far that they bastardize what probable cause means that they don't have a real definition of probable cause anymore. And so now probable cause means a dog barks at your car and that's probable cause. That is probable cause. That's what probable cause is. The dog barked. That's probable cause. We got the dog barking. And what is, the dog, what is the dog barking probable cause based on? The jurisprudence is on what case? Terry versus Ohio. Terry versus Ohio. That's how Florida versus Harris stands is from Terry versus Ohio. You have to know the 2001 case of Atwater versus City of Lago Vista that absolutely anything is arrestable. If you do anything at all, spit on the sidewalk. If your windows are tinted too dark, you can be arrested. You can be arrested. You can be arrested for screaming if you're disorderly. Your speech is gone. The 1989 case of Graham versus Connor makes it so the cops can use any amount of force they want on you as long as they think it's reasonable. As long as they write in the report, it was reasonable to crack your skull, then it's perfectly fine. You have to know this case. I'm, I'm very lightly touching on Graham versus Connor. You have to research this whole damn case. It's in the Terry era, the main video on my YouTube page. I reenact the entire case. I spent the majority of the budget on the documentary, the Terry era, on Graham versus Connor. The majority of the budget of that film went to that case. I mean, the overall theme was Terry, but this fits into Terry. Oh, I'm so sorry. DeThorne Graham was stopped on a Terry stop. 
He was stopped on a Terry stop that a cop was suspicious of DeThorne Graham for going in and out of a convenience store. And that now creates Terry versus Ohio, the right for a cop to be suspicious of you, now creates Graham versus Connor that the cop stopped DeThorne Graham, DeThorne Graham, on a Terry stop because he went in and out of a convenience store and didn't buy anything. So that no matter what he stole, what happened to him, which he didn't steal anything, even if he did is what I'm saying, they beat the, sh the, the holy goodness out of DeThorne Graham. Okay? They put him in the hospital. They broke his foot. They cracked his head. They popped his ribs. They beat him senseless. And then the, the, the Supreme Court found in the favor of Connor and expanded police powers. You have to know the 1980 case of Johnson versus Glick that allows, if you're put in jail, dude, you should see me turn into a beta male. You should see me. You should see me turn into a beta male. You guys think I'm beta? You think I'm a beta guy? Do I seem like, do I seem like I'm beta to you? Do I seem like I'm a beta male? Nothing against betas. We need beta males too. We need every person. We need everybody we can get. There's, there's C's, there's D's, there's E's, there's F's. Everybody counts. Your life is just as valuable as an A personality male. However, however, when you're put in the dungeon, dungeon because of Johnson versus Glick, if you want to be an A personality male, the guards will kill you. You will die. You want to be alpha in jail? You'll die. You'll die. You'll die. Your best bet because of the 1980 holding of Johnson versus Glick, because of this holding here by the Supreme Court, when I go to jail, I shut the up, I, my hands go between my legs, my eyes go down, I'm a mute, whatever I'm told to do, I'll do. I'm a total drone beta male, because I don't want to die by some Neanderthal in jail. who He took that job because he gets good benefits and he's got two kids. And he only has to torture people, but he, he, he compartmentalizes that. I don't want to die. So that's Johnson versus Glick. You have to know that case. You have to know the case of Johnson versus Glick. So those are just a few of the important ones. If you guys want to get a copy of my poster, please go to deletelaws.com. Whoosh! Deletelaws.com. That's, that's my poster company. You can buy a poster there. My donations don't work on Delete Laws. I have to update a plugin. I don't know how to do it. Uh, I haven't been able to do it. You can get the posters, the ebook on Delete Laws. These are my cup of coffee funds. If you learned anything from me, please go by and pick me up a cup of coffee. My cup of coffee fund is at zero. <laughs> so if you learn anything at all from me and you want to buy me a cup of coffee, God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it so much. These are my cup of coffee funds. Please don't be shy. I'm talking about a black cup of coffee from Starbucks if you're so willing. Thank you. Okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Whoop. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Oh, shit. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. So uh, if I have any questions or anything like that, I'll be happy to answer any questions for you guys. Um, you, you absolutely have to know these cases. This is coming up on 52 minutes. I'm going to try to keep it under an hour. So we only have um, eight minutes left, and I'm going to jump off here. I'm going to be on here for one hour, eight more minutes. I'm going to cover a couple more cases. Oh, you have to know Gonzalez versus Reich. You have to know this holding. You have to know this case. You have to know it. And by the way, there is an absolute ton of information online for Gonzalez versus Reich. This is a major, major case in American history. It's where Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg collude together to make sure that marijuana is going to stay illegal. And that's when the most people in America get arrested throughout the history of time is because of these two colluding together in Gonzalez versus Reich. He also, uh, I believe it's, um, I want to say Breyer, but that's not the judge who came with him. It's, uh, it's in the ebook. It's in the ebook. What's that? What's that? What's that other guy's name? Was it Kennedy? I think it was Kennedy who went with him. Kennedy who voted. So th there's a trifecta of cases here that you have to understand how they work and how they work in conjunction with one another. It is absolutely disgusting. This goes back to the 1942 case of Wicker versus Filburn. That's not on my poster, but but the 1942 case of Wicker versus Filburn, this is going to be the case that creates and establishes the Commerce Clause as being a major player inside of the legislator creating laws, the people who we vote for creating laws that go against us, they'll use what's called the Commerce Clause. And so they'll use the Commerce Clause to create absolutely any law. And so that's how they try to close the door on medicinal marijuana in the year 2005, in the case of Gonzalez versus Reich. This is where Reich is a, I think she's a cancer patient, and then she sues the Attorney General of the United States, Gonzalez, who's working for Bush, 
And, and, and Reich says, hey, I have a right to grow homegrown marijuana after federal agents raided her house and took her plants and burned them. And the Supreme Court rules against her. And they had been using the Commerce Clause to uphold the constitutionality of banning homegrown marijuana. But in the 1995 case of Lopez, which is about guns, uh, Scalia voted against using the Commerce Clause and they won five to four. Ruthie lost because she's a piece of garbage anyway, along with the garbage man here. Uh, and I'm sorry about that, garbage man. I apologize for saying that. Along with this piece of garbage here, garbage men are good people. Garbage women are good people who work hard for their money. They were not appointed to their jobs like these two demons burning in hell today. So in the in the 95 case of United States versus Lopez, he says you can't use the Commerce Clause, outvotes Ruth five to four. And then in the United States versus Morrison, Violence Against Women Act, uh, again, a five to four decision where him and Kennedy vote to not use the Commerce Clause and they outvote Ruthie Poo. And, and then right here in 2005 in Gonzalez versus Reich, he says, no, no, we're not using the Commerce Clause. We're using the Necessary and Proper Clause, you see? Yeah, 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 you see, we're using this law. We're not using these ones because I can't use this because I'm a textualist. But when it comes to marijuana, I hate it. So I'm just going to say that we're going to use the necessary and proper clause. And that's Gonzalez versus Reich, where he uh, writes a, a, a concurring opinion, different though, or is dissenting, uh, uh, and he writes his own opinion that they're using the necessary and proper clause, when really this is written on what? The necessary, the, the commerce clause. They were using the commerce clause, not the necessary and proper clause. So he just changes which legislation is being used by the, by the powers vested in the Constitution that allow them, the legislators, to write that law. And he says, no, they're using the necessary and proper clause. They weren't. They used the interstate commerce clause, you piece of crap liar, for people who are morons, for people who don't know the difference between using the commerce clause and the, the necessary and proper clause. When this was written, it was written using the interstate commerce clause. You can't apply the necessary and proper clause just because you want to. Demon. 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 Burning in hell. Demon. Demon. The only gun legislation passed by who? By who? Conservatives. Conservatives. The only gun legislation in America that's been passed has been by conservatives. It's a great big scam, guys. It's a great big scam. We need a third party organization that we're creating now. We're, we're creating it right now with the, with the couple hundred people who come through here at a time. We're creating it right now. We're creating a new third party. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So anyway, so that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, you guys want to copy my post or get it to delete laws? You guys, uh, I gave you all my, my sales spiel stuff. All right, cool. If you guys want to jump in, do it. Um, I do have about 20 people waiting on a list to send a poster out to. I will send you guys out free posters if you guys ask me for one. You guys can get one at delete laws uh, at gmail.com. I'll send you a free poster if you don't have any cash. I I, so, I told one guy, he said, I, 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 <laughs> It's just so funny. People are just so funny. You know what I mean? It's no skin off my back to give you one for free if you don't have any money, dude. It doesn't, it, it just takes a little time for me to click the buttons. Uh, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to say anything other than thanks and awesome, bro. Click, print this shit out. Go, go stack up your quarters until you get 30 bucks worth and go print this out at Office Max. And then, and then the gift I gave you is worth it. Then it's worth it. Then you actually are talking about these cases and you go back to this video that is a one hour long and you go, dude, he goes over all the cases. Let's just go listen to him talk. And then that's a conversation starter for your house. And I'm happy to be able to contribute that to you as people contribute to me. You see, you see how it works? It's, it's cyclical. It's cyclical. Everything goes together. Everything goes together. Okay. Okay. Okie dokie, pokey smokey. Uh, I'm, listen, I only have so many of me, so I, I've got a few letters about Brookside. I haven't got, um, um, I haven't gotten a, the the right letter yet. I did advise someone today about their civil, about their uh, constitutional rights on a marijuana case that I just showed him where to look. I can't, I can't give legal advice because I haven't passed the state bar yet. But um, I'll take the state bar this next year in 2022 in California, and we'll we'll see. After that, I'll be able to give legal advice, um, and I still won't give legal advice. I'm not gonna give legal advice on the internet. I'll tell you guys what I think. Here's the case law you should read. Here's what I would look at if I were you, you know, but I can't give legal advice or I'll get in trouble. And, and believe me, the powers that be eventually will, will, wanna, will wanna make me be quiet or try to limit the voice I have for sure. Oh my God, I'm at one hour. I gotta get the flock out of here. Okay guys, listen, thanks so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Uh, um, I, let's continue to flex our rights. So let me just give one last little thing and then I'm gonna get off here because I'll be at one hour exactly then. 
when, so when the police pull me over, you guys notice when I interact with the cops, right? I don't have to give away the dominion over my person. You don't, if you're a cop, you don't get to demand that I sit here, that I stand there, that I sit on the curb with my, no, I, you don't get to do that. I, I'm over, listen, I'm a full grown man. I'm over 40 years old. I, I agree to be detained in this little area. I do not agree that you have dominion over every single ounce. Oh, thank you for the, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, super chat. Thanks. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to get a sure recorder that's coming up. You guys hit the like button. Take your finger if you would. Reach over and hit the like button. Just reach over and hit the hit the like button. Just hit, There's a like button either right there or right there. Reach over and hit the like button. So now here's the thing. When, when you get pulled over by the police, you don't have to give them dominion over every part of your body. I'm not going to sit down in the driver's seat because you tell me to. I'm agreeing to being detained. I'm not a felon. I don't have a felony on my record. I don't have a violent history. I've never assaulted anybody. That means from the history of my record, empirical evidence would tell you, Officer Joe Blow, that I'm not a danger to you or to society, meaning you have no probable cause to search my car going around the automobile exclusionary rule of the 1925 Carroll case. You don't have a right to search my vehicle because I've clearly identified that I'm not a felon and that I'm not a danger to you. I'm agreeing to be detained in this area. That doesn't mean I have to submit to everything you tell me to do. You're not my daddy. You're not the boss of me. You're not going to tell me this is my stop. I'll control it where no, you don't control shit. You are a public servant. I'm here with my rights, meaning that I am the powerful being here. I don't mean I'm alpha where I'm alpha over that guy, which I am anyway. That's not the point. I mean, I'm alpha with my rights. I'm the citizen. I'm the winner here. You're the public servant serving me and my rights. That's your job, copper. Your job is to serve me and my rights. And you're supposed to fight for every single right that I have. That's why you took an oath to the Constitution when you became a police officer, not a law enforcer. That is the founding fathers, if they heard the term law enforcers, would roll over in their grave. They never wanted law enforcers in America. No one ever in the founding of our country said, hey, let's have people and call them law enforcers. No. So when you get pulled over, you explain to the cop. I'm agreeing to be detained here. That doesn't mean you have dominion over my person. You're not going to lock me in shackles and hurt me and torture me with those shackle cuffs because you're pulling me over for a traffic violation that you're claiming I did, which is some ticky tack nonsense. So you can pull me over. Okay. So with that being said, I want you to have, be empowered the next time you deal with a cop and explain to him, he doesn't have dominion over me. I looked up what dominion means. And that means I have to, I'm subservient. I give up my sovereignty to you and I don't. You're not my daddy. And I will not just bow down kowtow to you because you put on a badge and wear a gun and you follow orders like a real champ, you beta. So, all right. All right. Okay. I'm at, I'm at 62 minutes. I better get the hell off here. Um, so now you guys know it, please go by and pick up my poster on Delete Laws. I really appreciate it. I really haven't sold any posters this week. Just two posters, I think you guys. So I gave away about 50 so far. I got 20 more to give away. I don't care if it's 10 to one ratio, I'll continue to give them away. But a few people, if you guys could buy a poster, absolutely amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to get the hell out of here. It was really nice talking to you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, DeleteLaws.com with a Z. If you need one for free, DeleteLaws at gmail.com. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you soon, and we'll see you next time. Later.